Good morning, guys. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, my name is Dr. Antonio Grisefalo, and today we're going to be talking about George Orwell. This is number three in our series on adventure authors. We did, do you remember? Who was the first one that we did? I didn't. Uh, Jack London. Jack London. And number two? Hemingway. And then number three, today George Orwell. And also in there, I did uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. It was not part of the series, but it worked well with the series. All right, so today we're going to talk about George Orwell. And um, he was born in 1903, died in 1950, so he was not terribly old. I know it seems old for you students, but as I am already older than George Orwell, I think it's not terribly old. Uh, socialist, adventurer, British Empire policeman in Burma, and a volunteer in the Spanish Civil War. He lived among the poor in London and Paris and among coal miners in Wigan, and his greatest contribution to literature and political science is called 1984. And uh, this is actually from the book, 1984. This is one of my personal favorite books from George Orwell, which is called Burmese Days. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, this is Homage to Cat Catalonia, which is about his experience in the Spanish Civil War. One of the reasons why I chose George Orwell for this series is because his life parallels Hemingway. Uh, and then, of course, we did a, 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 a presentation on F. Scott Fitzgerald as well, and there's some overlap. But particularly with Hemingway, as Hemingway was also... Okay, this is exactly the same information. One difference, and, and I don't mean to be rude to George Orwell, but one difference between George Orwell and Ernest Hemingway or Jack London is that George Orwell was not the best, handsomest man in the world. Or, or is he? Would you like to marry him? No, the students said no. But the cameras, no, the students said no. Okay. Though he was a socialist, he was a socialist. He did a lot of writing about socialism, but what's very interesting is that he wrote very commercial uh, stories that made a lot of money. Uh, Orwell is a fiction. Blair created him. He's an attitude. Not a real human being. We enjoy seeing the attitude apply itself to real subjects. Another reason why I chose George Orwell, and why I like George Orwell, why I like Ernest Hemingway, and why I like Jack London, is because they became characters. They created their own character. George Orwell is not even named George Orwell at his birth. He created the George Orwell character and the myth that went with it. One of the most influential authors of the 20th century. He permanently altered the English language. He invented a lot of words. There's, there's whole pages of words that he invented, particularly for this book, for 1984, which have been uh, incorporated into the English language. Uh, the concept of Big Brother, for example. And often when Americans talk about uh, North Korea, Chaoxian, when we talk about North Korea, we use a lot of these words that George Orwell invented because it's a very similar society. Um, thought Police, Room 101, Memory Hole, New Speak, Double Think, Thought Crime, and Cold War. Cold War, right? Everybody's heard that word that actually comes from George Orwell. He also inspired his own adjective, Orwellian. And Orwellian is an adjective that we we'll use. We used to use to describe Burma before uh, they became a democracy a few years ago. And we say this about uh, North Korea today. It's Orwellian. His most important works include 1984, uh, which was published in 1949. And a lot of people think uh, it's very amazing that in 1949 he was able to predict or to project what would happen that far in the future. Uh, he wrote Animal Farm, which is a novella, and we talked about that with Hemingway. Do you guys remember Hemingway wrote a novella that was very famous? Do you remember the name? The Old Man. Yeah. Yeah, what is it? The Old Man in the Sea. The Old Man in the Sea, very good, okay. So a novella is like a novel, but it's just very short, and that's how Animal Farm is. Other notable works include The Road to Wigan Pier, Amish to Catalonia, Down and Out in Paris and London, and Shooting an Elephant which is a story I read when I was a very young boy and it made an impression on me for the rest of my life. Burmese Days and the Short Story Collection. His real name is Eric Arthur Blair. When he was born, that was his name. He later changed it to George Orwell. He was born in 1903 and um, his father 
was a servant of the British <coughs> government. He was a, in the British government service in India. So George Orwell was born in India and he was raised in India. And it's another reason why I like George Orwell a lot because of this India connection. And one of my other favorite authors is Rudyard Kipling who wrote quite a lot about the British Raj, which is what we call the British Empire in India at that time. Uh, his mother, they were, Britain is very different from America because Britain has a class stratified society. So if your father is uh, related to the king or if your mother is from a royal family, uh, you could be from uh, a good family and yet not have money. In America, everything is about money. In America, everything's about money, but uh, in America, everything's about money, but in Britain, everything's about class. So his mother was from a high class family, but they actually didn't have a lot of money. Um, the, the money the family had, the mother's family, came from the Opium Wars, and one of her, I think her grandfather, made a lot of money in Jamaica, which was at that time a British colony. At the age of five, he began attending Catholic school. Uh, in September 1911, Eric received a scholarship to attend St. Cyprian. So in, in Britain at that time, and I think even today, uh, which university you go to is very important, and the way you get into the good university is by going to the good high school, and the way you get to the good high school is by going to the good elementary school. And so at that time, it was a really big deal for his mother to try and get him into a good school. And it helped that she came from a family that was upper class, but they also didn't have any money. So it was always kind of a, a difficulty to get Eric into the right schools. Uh, when he was, uh, he had two pieces of writing published while he was still a student. He already began to publish his writing. Um, and he won a scholarship to Eton, which is one of the best prep schools in England. Uh, and he attended from 1917 until 1921. Among his teachers was the French author Aldo Huxley, uh, who is a French author, and he wrote a book called Keith, do you know? Aldo Huxley, Brave New World. And Brave New World in 1984 are very similar stories, and Aldo Huxley was his teacher at, uh, at school in England. And, um, And he was considered a very lazy student, by the way. He liked writing, but he didn't like anything else. So there's three related works that he did. Uh, Burmese Days, 1984, and Animal Farm. And some people have said that it's actually a trilogy. It's, it's one continuous story. Uh, Burmese Days is about empire. And Burmese Days, he wrote that about being, he was a... Uh, policeman in India, a British policeman in India. And the British people had a lot of rights, and the local people had very little rights. And so he already started writing about this, this idea that there was this government, and they were very powerful, and they had all the guns, and they had all the power, and the people were being subjugated. So in a way, Burmese Days actually uh, leads up to Animal Farm in 1984. He was born in British India, as I said, and he was a policeman in Burma. So he saw this government, I don't want to call it oppression, but he saw this, this governmental system firsthand, both in India and in Burma. 1985, Animal Farm. So in Animal Farm, basically, you start out where the people have all the power and the animals have no power. And then slowly, the animals start to take control of the farm. And everybody's equal, and it's wonderful. And then at the end of the story, the pigs have all the power and the other animals have no power. And so basically we can see the same thing happens over and over again. Um, George Orwell also, uh, he lived in the slums of Paris and London. So he lived among very poor people. So remember his family, his mother was high class, but she, they didn't have a lot of money, but they were high class. And he went to good schools and he met good people. And then he was in Burma and he starts to question you know, if, if this system is, is right, if it's okay to have a few people with all the power and all the money and the other people have nothing, then he decides he's going to go live in the slums in Paris and London, to go live in the place where the poorest people live and he worked as a dishwasher 
And there's another reason why I like him because Jack London wrote a very similar book called On, On the Road. I'm sorry, The Road. Um, and then he went to a place called Wigan in England and he lived among coal miners. And these people were very poor and they worked very, very, very hard. And he began to have these ideas about socialism at that time. Wigan is also important for me because it's the place where uh, catch wrestling was invented. So anyone who knows, I have a PhD in wrestling, and so I've had to study Wigan before. Uh, 1984, in 1984, he creates what's called a dystopic, dystopic future. If I use the word utopia, utopia means, do you know that word, utopia? It means something like heaven, like some, where everything's wonderful. But this word, dis Topic. This always means the opposite. This topic means a future where everything is terrible. Okay? And this adjective, he didn't invent this adjective, but it's, it's generally used in association with his writing. Um, he wrote about a dystopic future where there, were, there was a, a very repressive government. It's very much like Chao Xian today, like North Korea today. Like government has all the power and the people have nothing. And also the people are very poor, very unhappy. Um, after World War II, when, when World War II came, a lot of the world was very poor before World War II. The world is much richer today than it was then. There's more rich countries today than there were before World War II. When World War II came, a lot of people had a feeling that you had rich, powerful governments sending poor people to go fight and kill each other. And they began to have a lot of questions if this is really the right system that we want to have. And also in Germany, you know, there was a man named Adolf Hitler, and he had complete control of the government, and the people had no, no rights and this and that. And so this was um, how this sort of socialist ideas were coming into literature and into also George Orwell's writings. You'll find that great authors often knew each other. Uh, I talked about this a lot when I talked about F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway. They knew each other. They knew Pablo Picasso. All these people knew each other in Europe. And um, they often inspired each other to write very similar uh, works. I honestly uh, did not find anything that said that Hemingway and Orwell had met, but I would have to believe that they must have because they were in Paris around the same time. But uh, he did know Aldo Huxley, and Aldo Huxley wrote A Brave New World, which is almost uh, you know, a very similar story to 1984. Political and social allegory. Animal Farm is called an allegory. And what an allegory means, it's almost like a fairy tale. It means we take real problems that people have, and we make a story but Animal Farm is not about people, right? We have, we have animals in the story. We call that an allegory. So we can talk about a problem without actually saying, and he doesn't say Hitler, he doesn't say the name of, of some king or something that he opposes, right? We call that an allegory. I don't know, are you familiar with this story, Gulliver's Travels? Have you, Nancy, have you ever heard of it or read it yet? Yeah. Yeah. So Gulliver's Travels, this is from, look at, look at the date, 1726. And this book, Gulliver's Travels, and basically, if you look at the picture, you have all these little people fighting the one big person. It's very easy to, uh, to understand what they're trying to represent without saying it, right? They're trying to say, you know, they don't want to have a king anymore, they want to have more freedom, and so forth. Um, and so, uh, Animal Farm is very similar to Gulliver's Travels. And when I was a boy, especially, uh, I actually had, I believe, this, this coloring, this is a coloring book that I had when I was, when I was a little kid. So this is a really common, common picture, and you see sort of this big Gulliver, and he's beating up the castle where the tiny kings lived. Uh, great authors inspire other great authors, or be, because uh, they live at the same time, two authors may have written about similar themes. So the three authors we've looked at in our series were Jack London, Ernest Hemingway, and today George Orwell. Um, these two are, are uh, almost exactly around the same time that they're both writing, although Hemingway outlives Orwell because Orwell died very young. He was not even 50 years old when he died. Jack London's quite a bit older than they are, but they, they all lived at the same time. 
Orwell spoke French well enough to write and publish stories in that language. He also spoke several Burmese regional languages as well as Hindi, the language spoken in India. Uh, and here we have this, <laughs> I love this, I love this picture of Ernest Hemingway. So Ernest Hemingway, of course, spoke a lot of languages. He spoke Spanish extremely well. He spoke French. He spoke Italian. He spoke German. They all seem to have spoken French. Uh, it seems to be very common. There's no evidence that London spoke languages, but all three men traveled extensively and wrote both fiction and nonfiction books about faraway places, about exotic places. Uh, you know, on adventure, this is Jack London. We know that he went, he went to the Klondike, which is the, the snowy region up in Canada, to look for gold. He went out on the sea on his boats. Uh, Hemingway, of course, went on the sea on his boats. He was also a big game hunter in, in Africa. George Orwell went to Paris and London, and he lived in the uh, down and out places where people had no money. He also lived in Burma and in India. At age 19, George Orwell went on, uh, went on to be an Empire policeman in Burma, and Hemingway at 19 served as a Red Cross ambulance driver in the First World War. London was 19 when he returned from the Klondike, where he had been prospecting for gold. So the commonality was, one, that they all had adventures very young. Well, one, also, that they all knew they wanted to be authors. They all knew that from day one, I want to be an author. They all knew they wanted to live lives that would allow them to write. And at very young ages, they had these big adventures. So Jack London went off to the Klondike to look for gold. It was very dangerous. It was very exciting. He wrote Call of the Wild. He wrote White Fang, all these things. He was 19 when he had those experiences. Uh, this is Ernest Hemingway in the First World War. And this became the book, A Farewell to Arms. This is George Orwell as an Empire policeman in Burma, and uh, he wrote Burmese Days about that experience. So they're very <coughs> similar experiences in life paths. Uh, Jack London wrote this book called The Road, which later inspired Jack Kerouac to write what book, Keith? On. On, <laughs> on the road. <laughs> but the original actually is by Jack London. And uh, these people, these people, we call these people hobos. Hobo. And what that means, these people, they don't have a proper job, they don't have a proper home, and they follow the railroad, and they just go wherever the train, sometimes they'll jump on the train and ride without buying a ticket, sometimes they walk, and they go to each town, they look for work, they might work one day or two days, and then go to the next town, and they just move like this. So Jack London went and did that. He followed these men around and he wrote about them. And of course, we know that George Orwell, very similarly, he went to Wigan with the coal miners, he went to Paris and London and worked with day laborers there as well. Very similar life paths. And again, writing about the poor people, Jack London was also a socialist. Jack London wrote The People of the Abyss, which is about the people who live in the poorest neighborhoods uh, in America. Uh, George Orwell, the road to Wigan Pier. This place, Wigan, today is uh, still, you know, it's very poor. Uh, most of the coal mines have closed, but at that time, it was, it was also very poor. Um, this is, uh, I believe this is in, this might be the unemployed people in either Wigan or in the United States. Uh, lining up to get coupons so they can get food. Both London and Orwell became involved in socialism, as we know. Um, uh, this is Orwell and Marxism here, this book. Uh, the Radical Jack London, this is his political writing about um, socialism. Uh, other socialist writings of Jack London. Ernest Hemingway was not a socialist. He was an anti, 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 anti-socialist. Uh, Orwell's Burmese Days, 1934, is similar to Hemingway's The Green Hills of Africa. So, um, George Orwell, you know, he 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 was born in India. Uh, he lived most of his life in England. Um, he spent time in Paris, uh, and then later Scotland, but Burma. And he was only there a few years, but Burma changed him and for the rest of his life. It, it was a very special place for him. That's why he wrote this book. And same thing with Hemingway. Hemingway didn't actually live in Africa. He went to Africa several times. 
and spent months uh, on safari in Africa hunting and, and so forth. But um, he wrote a lot about Africa. And so it's very, very similar ideas. Orwell wrote this story that is probably the first Orwell story that I ever wrote, read. I was probably in sixth or seventh grade, I think seventh grade when I read it. It's called Shooting an Elephant. So he was a police inspector in Burma, and there was an elephant, and it was killing all the people in the village. And this really happened. And so the villagers came, and they said to him, hey, you're the policeman, you have to help us. And George Orwell said, you know, I'm from London, I don't know what to do about an elephant. They said, no, you have to kill the elephant. And George Orwell said, I don't, I don't know how to kill an elephant. When you have a gun, you'll kill the elephant. So he just takes all of his guns from his police office and he starts shooting this elephant. And of course, it doesn't die. His elephants are so big and he just keeps shooting and shooting. And it's just a, this horrible story. The elephant just suffers so terribly. And meanwhile, all the people from the village are, are watching this. And if he doesn't kill the elephant, they're going to be angry. And if he kills the elephant, they're going to be angry because he made the elephant suffer. And he's just in this terrible situation. Um, Hemingway wrote a book called The Short Happy Life of Francis McCumber. And this is about a, a hunting guide in Africa. And it's very, very, very similar, in many ways, similar story. Hemingway wrote For Whom the Bell Tolls, which is about the Spanish Civil War. So Hemingway was in the Spanish Civil War uh, mostly as a journalist. Later, he often changes his stories later. And he was a soldier and this and that, but I think mainly he was a journalist. George Orwell was actually a soldier in the Spanish Civil War. He volunteered. Uh, we talked about that during the Hemingway presentation, but uh, neither America nor England entered the Spanish Civil War because it was a civil war, but a lot of individuals from America and England looked at the Spanish Civil War and they felt sorry for the people in Spain and they wanted to help them. So they went and they joined uh, the army. And so that was, that was what uh, George Orwell did. And then he wrote this book called Homage to Catalonia. All three men served in wars. This is Jack London in Machu Picchu. Manchuria, in China. <laughs> yeah, this is when the Japanese, be, kind of before World War II, the Japanese invaded Manchuria. Uh -huh. And so Jack London came to China as a journalist to write about the war. Yeah, this is, I think, I, I'm not sure the year, 1937, 30, yeah, something like that. So this is kind of kind of before World War II or leading up to World War II, and uh, Hemingway on war. Hemingway uh, was in the First World War and then he was in the Second World War and the Spanish Civil War as a journalist. Uh, George Orwell, of course, was an empire policeman and then he was in the Spanish uh, Civil War. And Jack London was also a war correspondent in a number of wars. Conclusion, great lives make great authors. The first step to becoming a great author is to live a life that is worth writing about. Great authors read extensively. Uh, there's, a, there's a famous American author, uh, his name is, uh, who wrote Bloodsy, Bloodsy Blues? And, uh, ah, God. There's a famous American author, but he was in the Army during World War II, and his friend said to him, I want to be an author. What should I read? And Neil Simon, Neil Simon, Neil Simon, Neil Simon. Neil Simon was in the army, and his friend said to him, I want to be an author. What should I read? Neil Simon said, read the whole third floor of the library. Uh, so great authors read extensively. You, you can't write if you don't read. You have to read first. You have to read first. You have to put the knowledge in before the knowledge can come out. That's why we go to school before we become teachers, right? We don't do it the other way around. Same thing with your writing. And for you too, students, the great authors are inspired by other great authors. So two reasons why we need to read. One, it puts knowledge into us. Two, it teaches us how to write. And we can find other authors that we really like, and they will inspire us in our own writings. So, you listen to me talk about reading long enough. Now go, read a book.
Thank you very much, students.